right, so let's, let's start with a story first. So back in 2003, and on his way to a business trip in Singapore, Steve Wynn was on, uh, dropped his wife and daughter off at the Four Seasons Hotel in Paris. And the next morning, Elaine, his wife, and their daughter Julian ordered breakfast to their room. And Julian ordered a delicious croissant. It was one so rich she could only eat half of it. King not to waste the croissant, she wrapped it back up and left it on the side. And she would enjoy the rest when she returned later that day. <coughs> when Julian and Elaine returned to their room, the croissant was gone. Housekeeping must have assumed it was there to be thrown away. But Elaine then noticed a flashing light on the hotel room floor. She called reception and they answered, Mrs. Wynne, thanks for calling us. We wanted to know when you were back in your room. The housekeeper had re uh, has made sure the kitchen has kept a croissant for you. The one you left would have gone dry by now. Now to achieve an experience like this, one where Elaine was so impressed, she immediately called her husband Steve. There are some essential steps that needs to happen. Somebody needs to actually be cleaning the room in the first place to understand or to, to realize that the croissant had been left. Someone would then need to ask the kitchen staff if they would keep a croissant to a side. Somebody would then need to keep the croissant fresh in the kitchen and make sure it wasn't touched. Somebody would need to let reception know about the situation so they could leave a message. <coughs> and someone would need to leave a message on the hotel room floor to make sure that Julian and Elaine understood what had happened. And of course then someone would need to be around to answer Elaine's call and understand the context around why they were calling. Then somebody would need to prepare the croissant and, make, and, and let the kitchen know that they were back. They prepare it, make sure it was ready for room service, and finally somebody would deliver the croissant. And if we look at these steps and assign roles, this customer experience took four different roles of four different people to deliver it. And let's now consider a scenario where only the housekeeper saw the value in doing this. The kitchen staff, the receptionist, the porting staff didn't understand the value in delivering a customer experience like this. The customer experience that Julian and Elaine went through couldn't have happened. When these roles aren't all on board, we miss out on some essential steps. A croissant wouldn't have been put to the side. The receptionist wouldn't have left a message on the phone so Elaine knew what was happening. But say now we bring in a few of those roles again. And the receptionist and the porting staff are now at a change of heart and they're on board with what's going on. Unfortunately, the kitchen staff still don't see the value in doing this. So even though the majority, three of the four roles that we've talked about, are on board, they understand the value in delivering this customer experience. This still isn't going to happen. Yes, the housekeeper is going to realize the croissant had been left. Yes, the receptionist could leave the message. The porter is ready and waiting to deliver the croissant. But because the kitchen staff didn't keep the croissant to his side, it's game over. So we bring everyone back in now. And the housekeeper, the kitchen staff, the receptionist, the porter, these are what we call a cross-functional team. But what allowed the Four Seasons Hotel to deliver a truly delightful customer experience? And it was that shared understanding. This all started with the thoughtful intentions of a housekeeper. They understood that a core pillar of the Four Seasons was truly personal service. But they also knew that they needed a team around them to deliver on this. They couldn't do this just by themselves with their own skills and responsibilities. They need others. And it's shared understanding that allows us to deliver delightful customer experiences. Steve Wynn is the owner of Wynn's Hotels and Casinos. And when Julian and Elaine told him about their experiences, he was amazed and it inspired him to think about the, to question the, intent of the, the attentiveness of that housekeeper. And the experience of the Four Seasons began to form a new vision for Wynn Results. 
And Steve described this as his one professional wish. He wanted employees to relate to people, not as a customer with an employee, but as two human beings talking to one another. And with an ambition like this, Steve realized that it would be difficult to enforce systematically, especially without impossibly high amounts of monitoring. So in an effort to achieve this newfound ambition, Win Resorts introduced storytelling. So before each shift, housekeepers would meet with their inspectors, dealers would meet with their pit bosses, members of staff who deal with customers every day would meet with their teams and their immediate supervisors. The objective of these sessions was to answer one question. Did anything happen yesterday that was interesting? And slowly, hands would begin to rise. Employees would tell stories of how they had delivered truly delightful customer experiences. One employee tells a story of when he was checking guests into the resort, and he, they realized that they'd left a toiletry bag behind that contained some essential medicine for her husband's condition. The porter had taken the luggage and talked him out of cancelling the trip early and returning home. Instead, he arranged with his brother, who lived not too far away from the guest home, to pick the toiletry bag up from the guest housekeeper. He'd finished his shift, drove 150 miles through the night, collected the toiletry bag himself, brought it back to the guests so the medicine could be delivered at 7 a.m. that morning. When the porter was asked why he'd gone through so much trouble for the couple, he said that both he and his line manager could see how his actions would contribute to the resort's story. This story was a simple and clear narrative. It had been co-created by the, the executive team and it articulated an ambition for the business and it was one that linked back to Steve Wynn's vision to deliver the ultimate guest experience. And I want to introduce you to Barry. I don't know if any of you have ever met Barry before, but I've been fortunate enough to meet him through an old colleague of mine. Barry is completely blind, and it turned out that at the time I met him, he was having significant issues using the product I was working on. When I met Barry, I had the opportunity to observe and observe him attempt to navigate around the product on his phone. The screen reader would shout out these incoherent messages. And every time that, it was just every time that it said something, he never really knew what to do. It, was, it just didn't make sense to him. And the only thing that he could successfully really do is go around in this frustrating circle, which wasn't really ideal for him. So embarrassed and sorry by what I'd seen, I started to think about how I was going to tackle this. How was I going to solve the problems that Barry and people like him were going to face? And then it dawned on me, this wasn't my problem to solve. This was a problem that the team needed to solve. And so I asked Barry if he wouldn't mind returning into the office. I gathered the team in the research lab, the team that included the developers, business analysts, product managers, and I asked Barry to complete three simple tasks. Oh, sorry, three of our most common tasks. They would be simple to any, any other person, but unfortunately, with Barry's disabilities, that was an issue. And as I'd previously seen, Barry was unable to use the product. The team, like I was, were embarrassed and genuinely upset by what they'd seen. Watching someone use a product you use isn't, isn't an easy, uh, easy thing when they completely fail. And it was dehumanizing for Barry, going around in this frustrating circle. The developers suddenly stopped talking about software and start to build empathy for Barry. And that's something we've, we've talked about a lot today, building empathy. Wind Resorts introduced storytelling to build a shared understanding of their vision. And just like when employees would tell their stories before a shift, it was my job to tell this, uh, Barry's story to the team. This was all about building a shared understanding. And in the days and weeks following the, this session, you would see developers having meetings around how they could implement QA practices that would better cover off accessibility. How could we catch this sort of thing early? 
You heard that the screen readers being played in the office as they were trying to test out new HTML structures to see if they would be read out more coherently and ones where Barry would understand them better. And by exposing the team to Barry's story, I built a shared understanding. What came off the back of that was a shared responsibility. This was no one person's job anymore. As individuals, we approach challenges based on our experiences, our certainties, and our cultures. What we've been through forms our view of the world. And unconsciously, it's this view of the world that takes us into autopilot. We start to associate our previous experiences and the with the challenges that we face, and we form solutions based off of that. This is something that comes back from the Stone Age two and a half million years ago. We evolved to minimize the amount of cognitive output required in an effort to save the amount of brain power that we need for these situations of absolute uncertainty and danger. Now excluding its original and intended use, I'd like you to think of new and different ways to use this table now. Now, I've been thinking about some ideas myself, and I don't know what, what you folk have come up with, but here's the thing. I can guarantee that if you, asked the, or if you shared your ideas with the person on your left and the person on your right, you wouldn't have the same five answers. And this is a very basic example, but when we approach challenges as a diverse group, we can leverage other people's experiences their certainties and their cultures. And that's what I've illustrated here. As a collective, we've all come up with different uses for the knife. We've evolved a lot in the last two and a half million years, but we still use our autopilot. It's a thing, and we know it happens, but we should challenge it. We can and should challenge our autopilot. We advocate daily for diverse and inclusive products. Let's also push for a diverse and inclusive design process. Because by far, diversity is the easiest way to challenge our autopilot. We can collaborate with teams, and when we collaborate as a diverse group, we leverage these different perspectives. Opening the design process and inviting and encouraging others to be involved allows us to gain different perspectives. We'll be exposed to other people's autopilots that will challenge ours. And by having a collaborative and diverse process, our autopilot and our ideas are challenged. And these are all advantages to problem solving. Building a shared understanding where we're all marching towards a single commonly held vision. Collaborating as a diverse team these are advantages to problem solving. And this is exactly what we do for jobs. If we're to explore the definition of design, I like this one here from Jared School. And it's that design is the rendering of intent. Now if we're to take this and off the back of it look at the definition of a designer, it's somebody who can impact that rendering. The housekeeper at the Four Seasons Hotel didn't have the job type of a designer. But they made a decision that impacted the customer experience. And we just see decisions made like this all the time. A software engineer makes an architectural decision that impacts the load time of an API. The finance director cuts the budget, means that we have to deliver less but sooner. These are decisions that people without the job type of a designer make, but they directly or indirectly impact the customer experience that we deliver. And if the outcome of a decision you make has the potential to impact a customer experience, you are a designer. 
you're influencing the rendering of our intent. And so with this in mind, we need to start treating everyone as if they're designers. Often those of us with the job title of designer get precious about what we do. We're unwilling to involve other people in the process. And we'll proclaim things like, I'm here to do design. You'll have, you'll have sat in meetings and some of them, I'm the designer here. They, they get angry or precious about the fact that someone might not be listening to them. Instead of being precious about your job title, instead embrace the notion that everyone should be a designer. Our role changes to lead design within our organizations. And our objective should be to support teams in becoming better designers. To increase their competency in what we do. Helping them to make better decisions. And helping them to do great work as part of a diverse team. So enabling teams means increasing competency. And what I mean by this is that I'm not saying that our job as designers becomes redundant, but it's about educating our teams to think more like designers, to do better design and make those better decisions. When I talked before about the finance director and the decisions they made, they impacted the customer experience. And we can help influence them, and we can help them to make those better decisions later on. Ones where potentially they don't impact the customer experience as much, and if they do, it's in a positive way. Step one to, en to enabling teams is all about exposure. And this is something I do quite a lot more now in a new role that I'm in, which is exposing teams, your designers, developers, product managers, anyone in a cross-functional team, to their users, but also to the activities and the journey that we go through in design. We need to first actually show them what it is that we do, who we're doing it for, and why we do it. Step two is to involve them in the process. A great example of this is when we're writing discussion guides for usability testing. Historically, something I have done as well is I will take away, I will go away, sit at my desk, and I will write the discussion guide. And then go on and do the testing and all of that sort of stuff. But I've changed this to involve other people from the team. Instead we do an activity now, which is everyone lists out their concerns, their questions, the assumptions they're making, the gaps in their knowledge, and these form our questions. But what we're doing is we're involving them in the process to understand what we're asking, why we're asking it, and they feel like they're getting something out of the process. The testing isn't then just about a designer getting confidence in the solution. And step three is about passing the baton. And this is the one which gets a bit, gets some people a bit itchy. This doesn't mean that we're saying, go away, you do design. It simply means that we're getting them to a point where if we run around, they have the confidence and the ability to do good design and to make good decisions. If, for example, I was to leave my team and they didn't have a replacement, I'd be confident knowing that they're still going to do good research, it's research that's effective, and they're not going to forget about it because they've gone through this journey. And we get them thinking like a designer. Again, going back to the finance director, if we were enabling them to think more like designers and think about who we're designing for, they might not have made the same decision. And if we can get them to think more like designers, again, on the empathy note, if we can have them gain empathy for our users, we can influence that. So what happens if we don't treat everyone like a designer? First of all, we miss out on all of these advantages. We talked about shared understanding and how if we, if we build shared understanding, we can have a team marching together towards a commonly held goal. And that means we can deliver delightful customer experiences, just like Win Results did, and just like the Four Seasons. If we don't collaborate, we don't take people on a journey, and we don't get exposure 
to these different perspectives. We can't leverage other people's experiences. We work in a silo. Has anyone ever said or heard the phrase, it's technology's fault. They just can't deliver what we're asking for. They just don't get it. I've been in meetings where executives have said this from product teams, and it's just something I don't agree with. Is it technology's fault for not delivering on what we're asking for? Or is it all of our fault for not working together as a collaborative team and building a shared understanding? That's the difference. It's that if they knew the impact in a decision they'd made to affect the API, to, to slow down loading uh, response times with an API, they might have made a different decision. But for them, it's a different mindset, a different perspective. If we challenge that, educate them on being better designers, we might get better results. Silos don't foster create their collaboration. And when did UX design become about drawing boxes on a page? And I think I've got an answer to this question, which is it was when that we only start presenting the final result, the polished visual, the, potentially the wireframe. When teams and stakeholders only see this final, final output, they don't understand what we do. We need to take other members of our team, enable them to be better designers, and take them on the journey of design. We need to talk to them about why we're doing things and who we're doing it for. And we talked a lot about different design processes today. If we take our teams on the journey, they understand it's no longer about just drawing boxes, and they understand the complexity in which we deal with. And surely, they'll probably have ideas and contribute to that. So this is what I've come to talk to you about today. It's that delightful experiences come from shared understanding. And if only part of the team, where you as an individual in your team, is marching forward, your property is not going to deliver delightful customer experiences. Good designers have ideas, but great designers encourage ideas in others. If we enable teams, or if we, sorry, if we push for teams to be collaborative and diverse, then we can encourage other ideas out in people, and we can leverage those different perspectives and experiences. Everyone is a designer. If the decision you make can impact the customer experience, we should treat you as a designer. And also, with that, we need to enable teams through exposure, involvement, and then actually do it. We need to go through this three-step process, enabling teams to become better designers, regardless of your job title, so everyone becomes a designer. And it should be our goal to help everyone become better designers. Delightful customer experiences, designed as a, as, a, as a whole, should not be about who gets credit. Design should be about delivering value to our users, value to our businesses, and making sure that we deliver delightful customer experiences. Thank you.